Today we come together to celebrate and to honor our friend, husband, dad, scoutmaster, whatever title. <clears throat> the life and legacy of Jim Ramey. The Lord says there is a time, there is a time, there is a season. Today, that season, that time for you might be to mourn and to grieve. And to some, it's to laugh and to remember. I'm going to try to focus on that part right now, okay? Each of us handle loss in a different way, in our own way. And yes, today, some are going to cry and some are going to laugh. If you need some Kleenexes, they're right over there. Okay, my handkerchief is already soaked. So, I'm going to try to help you make, uh, make you feel a little bit uh, like you're here with Jim. Hopefully the Brutie song woke you up this, this afternoon. Uh, here's my easel. Because this was Jim's way of communicating. No fancy computers, no fancy stuff, just an easel and a board. And that's how you were trained. And don't forget, that special, special dark roast coffee is on the stove. And the biscuits and gravy, yes, Mr. Marks, just like the ones at Trail Life's first National event. Are in the pan and ready to be served. Are you prepared for your day? Do you have your wool socks on? Have you layered up your clothes? Because you know, you know, this is the best time to camp. There are no bugs. The duty roster is done. The program is ready. Remember, don't do for a boy what he can do for himself. Oh, by the way, by the way, sorry guys, I forgot one thing. You know, we figured that it was going to take roughly about a half a ton of bacon in order to feed all you guys. So we contacted Kroger and they said, you would have had to order that before the Daniel Boone. So, so I decided at least one of us should provide an adequate toast. And so, to you, Jim. Are you ready to learn something today from one of Trail Life's founding fathers? His passion, his purpose, and his patriotism. Boy, this bacon is pretty good. Jim would be ashamed of me. My first batch burnt it to a crisp. I mean, it was as it was it was darker than this this stage platform. I mean, it was. Let's put it this way. A Jewish priest would have been happy because it was a burnt sacrifice. I'm going to read from Psalm 27 today. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me and eat up my flesh, my, adver my adversaries and foes, it, sh it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked for, asked of the Lord, that, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty 
of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies or all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy, and will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, I do seek. Hide not your face from me, turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. They breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. And let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. A trailman honors God. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you uh, that you have gathered together friends and family, co-workers, trailmen, scouters, and those that are knew Jim, that knew your son, that dearly loved your son, that poured out into their lives that which you have get, that you gave to Jim. And he f- so freely gave. Lord, we thank you for uh, the time that you allowed us to spend with Jim. Some short, some a long time. Some a little too long longer than we care to remember. Lord, I pray that today we will honor your servant. We pray that we will celebrate, to celebrate a life well lived. Lord, we ask that you will comfort those that need comforted today that you will encourage the hearts of those that need a little lift today. And Lord, we pray that um, you will draw alongside, that you will raise up, you will raise up men that will fill those huge shoes. Lord, we pray, we thank you that you are taking care of your servant, Jim. Thank you for the time that you gave, that you allowed him to be a part of our lives. Lord, may you be glorified, may you be honored, may you be praised today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today you are really in for a treat because uh, you're not going to just hear from me. That's a good thing. Um, We have four speakers that are going to come up. I'm going to introduce them so that they can just come up as, as uh, as they can. First, this one is going to give us a little bit of a peek, a behind the scenes, the early days of Jim, and that's going to be from Jim's brother, Dan, Um, will be, uh, will be coming up. Next, uh, we will have probably the years we, most of us in this room, might remember. Uh, this guy uh, kind of represents, kind of was from the uh, Boy Scout side and now also from the Trail Life side to reach boys, to build build up and build together young men 
And that's going to be Tony Robinson. The third man is, is that which Trail Life mom Carol Beanie said would be Jim's best friend. It did indeed. The guy in Nashville, when Trail Life began, and, and his traveling buddy to all to Trail Life events across the country. That's our, uh, the North Central Region RTL, Kent Marks. And last, and not, not least, a representative of the next generation, albeit I'll hazard to say one of the big 12-year-olds that Jim has trained, and that's going to be Sean V2. So with that, I'll ask Dan if you would please come to the, to the podium. Jim would have been <laughs> humbled. I think it's the word that would best describe his feelings right now. He also would probably want to crawl under a rock somewhere. And unlike my big brother, I use technology. This is good. This can be better. All right. I've scripted a few things here. I'll probably stray away from it. But before we focus on who we're here to honor today, let me just take a moment and say thank you. As I look across this room, I see a number of individuals who have sacrificed their time, sacrificed for their finances in some situations to become mentors. Some of you are probably here because of a mentor. Some are probably here for the lack of having a mentor in your life and you decided I'm going to step up and fill the shoes. Maybe being around the kids keep you young. Perhaps it's the joy of seeing the expression on their faces when they've accomplished something. Or better yet, when they've dropped everything to help another achieve something. That's who my brother was. And you know that already. Teamwork. And in today's society, you realize that you may be that boy's only hope to help them find their way into this world. So let me take a moment to say thank you Give yourselves a little applause. Come on, I know. That's something that you're not supposed to pat yourself on the back. But you deserve that. You do. And I want to take a moment to say thank you on behalf of the Ramey family. It's a surprise when you get a phone call that something has come to an end. And I know many of you had your world shocked and rocked like, like we did. As many of you probably already know, Jim was first introduced to scouting as an elementary student up in Columbus with our twin cousins, Bob and Rodney Wilson. Bob is right here. He was one of the in the pictures you saw up here, <laughs> he, he and his brother, I called them out earlier this week. I said they were a handful. Of course, I didn't know because I was 10 years younger than you guys. But that just should say it all. The story is they were a handful. <laughs> That's what I found out. 
Dad was a troop leader. Mom was involved with the brownies. Sister Deb, she was a brownie. Jim was 10 years older than me. And Deb was 9 years older than me. Mike was 8 years older than me. And Mike was always in all the pictures we saw of the brownie troop. So from that moment on, as legend has it, Mike never made it to the Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts. He was a brownie. <laughs> he has lived with that joke most of his life. But he is a Browns fan. So, and he likes to eat brownies too. So that may be something you didn't know. I, I wanted to share some things from... Jim's eulogy. Some of you that might have seen the service online, uh, you've probably already heard this, but for the sake of those that have not, always be prepared, by the way. All three of my siblings are pillars in my life. I got something from each of them because they raised me just as much as mom and dad did, maybe even more. It was Debbie who I recall taking me to vacation Bible school. She was my babysitter, and she was my second mom. Through Mike, the closest thing we had in the family to an athlete, uh, I learned to enjoy sports and to find fun in life, even while working and even while things are tough. But through Jim, I learned servitude. As I've told Jim's boys, all the stuff that he taught them and all the kids over 40 plus years of either Boy Scouts or Trail Life USA. I was Jim's first project. See, Jim didn't get married until he was 26, and Mike and Deb had flown the nest already, and that left Jim and his little brother. We did stuff together. We would go to National Trail Raceway. He'd take me to the races. I even got to sit in the stands and watch him race when mom and dad weren't supposed to know he was racing. <laughs> and they wouldn't have found out because he said, don't you tell mom and dad. But had he beat the GTO with the larger block engine that he was driving, I wouldn't have said a word. <laughs> but he kept getting beat by the guy. And I said, maybe if I talk about it, he'll win one of these days. I don't know that it ever actually happened. Uh, he took me to the Air Force Museum in Dayton, taught me how to hunt, even bought me a shotgun. He bought me a trombone. Jim was a trombonist. Did any of you know that? He had a trombone. When it came time for me to start playing, I got to use his trombone. And it was really cool because I got to carry the case, and on the case he had... Do you remember Bud Man from the Budweiser days? We're talking late 1960s. Bud Man was a superhero, leotards the whole deal, and he had a big mud, a mug of suds in his hand. And he was on that trombone case. And I thought it was cool to get to walk around school with my trombone case with Bud Man. <laughs> well, Jim eventually bought me a brand new trombone. I still have both the shotgun and the trombone today. They have served me well, and it's something that my big brother helped me to understand how to use both. That's just the kind of guy he was. There was a moment in time we had an issue with our hot water tank at home, and the ground went out on it. And Jim had forgotten about that. And if you were sitting in the tub, you reached to turn off the water, you'd get, you would, it would get your attention. I'm just going to tell you that. It got Jim's attention too much one day. My bedroom was right on the other side of the wall from that faucet. I heard a body slide up against the wall. Water went splashing everywhere. And all I could hear was, Turn it off! Turn it off! Turn it off! And I'm like, what? And I burst into the bathroom, and he says, the circuit breaker, <laughs> turn it off. So I ran downstairs to the 
box. I flipped every switch over where I could, and finally it stopped. That was a tough time. He, he had some heart issues after that. I was credited for saving his life, but I was just the right place, the right time. But here's something you may not know. He saved my life. Here I am, I'm probably 14 years old at the time. We had the day off from school. Jim had taught me how to notice the track of deer. I saw some in the snow. We had a snow day. And I know those of us that went to Taze Valley, they always said, you always had snow days. What are you talking about? <laughs> we always seem to get out of school. But I found these tracks. And we lived over by the side of the river. And I tracked that deer as far as I could. And then I lost his, his track. But I was not dressed, prepared for the cold. And I was getting tired. The hypothermia started kicking in. And I knew I needed to find some shelter because the wind was blowing. It was cold. I, my fingers were getting numb. My toes were getting numb. And I just found a spot. I curled up thinking, I'm going to let this pass for a little bit. Then I almost lost my consciousness. I felt as though I needed to sleep. I closed my eyes, but what I could hear was a faint voice in the distance. Danny! Danny! My brother had come looking for me. And he got there just in time. Yes, he told me everything I did wrong on the way back to the house. <laughs> but I wouldn't be standing here today if not for Jim. Tony had called me after Jim had passed. And we were talking about it. And he said, Dan, I want you to know, Jim was our cold weather specialist. Jim never said it, but I have a feeling because of my experience, he wanted to prevent something like that from happening to one of you out here, to teach you how to survive, to teach you how to do the things, to teach you so that others might be able to watch you at work and learn from you, to treat you properly. To, yes, poke fun at you a little bit, to rough, you know, teach you some character. But also, to show you how to do it right. One of the pictures you didn't have, and I, I hope one day we can share it with you. I, I don't have the photo, but my brother Mike is drinking a bottle of Pepsi. He's about eight years old. Debbie, who's about nine, is next to him messing with her zipper on her jacket, I think it was. And then there's Jim wearing his scout uniform, at least the shirt up. <laughs> and he has this look about him like this, telling Debbie, certainly, you're doing it the wrong way. So this has been in part of Jim's life <laughs> all along. But he would show you how to do things, to do it right, so that you would learn, so that you could pass that along to the next person in need. I'm grateful for having had Jim as my big brother. And I know there's a number of you here who have no doubt experiences that will last a lifetime all because of Scoutmaster Jim. So again, thank you for what you're doing, being an example to these boys and your fellow mentors, and being what they need to see and what you need to be. I believe it's said best by Trail Life USA, Walkworthy. Thank you. 
I'm Tony Robinson, and uh, I was the uh, troop master of Troop OH-116, but my history goes back farther with Jim. Jim was my friend. I first heard of Mr. Ramey from Eagle Scouts in Troop 170. Boy Scouts. All spoke of Jim very highly as a man who trained them in the Eagle Feather program. They said that he even started that program. So I wanted to meet him. The district had a camporee at Tar Hollow State Park in 2011. We were camped about halfway down the hill. Tom Leach, another friend, was camped across the valley from us. And the first thing I heard in the morning was, Good morning, Mr. Ramey. From up on top of the hill behind me came a yell. Good morning, Mr. Leach. I knew that I had to meet Jim Ramey, the Jim Ramey. My boys have talked so much about him. <laughs> so I walked up that hill and introduced myself to him. Told him what the young men had been saying about him and my troop. And telling them that uh, the accolades that he they were being laid upon him. And he offered a cup of coffee. And that was the first cup of coffee we had. There's been many cups of coffee since then. There were many camperees and campouts, but the ones that stick out in my mind very clearly are the one we had with a camperee down in, at the Moose Club, just down the road here. We'd all gather together. It was a rainy day, just like every time we go out to camp, right, boys? <laughs> it was raining. But there was Jim with his coffee pot, and that's where I met Jeff Height, back in the corner here, who was working with Jim at his troop. I met Greg Gregory. I met Fred Mapes at that event. And there was a lot of Cub Scout camperees and, and summer camps that we all had together on here, and I remember those. I remember those. There's a lot of people here that I've seen that I knew from Boy Scouts, and I, I appreciate you all showing up today. Because this is a tough... A tough time. Jim had one of the busiest campsites going, and he still did, right up to the end. If you wanted a cup of coffee, you walked over to Jim's place. Jim had that coffee potty on, coffee pot on. The last time I was with Jim, we were sharing a cup of coffee. He was underneath a tarp. I got up about five, and he always did too. I walked over to Jim and I says, it's been a good camp out. Jim says, yes, it has. He said, uh, got the coffee pot on, you want a cup? And I said, yeah, you know I do. And he says, I don't know why I asked that. I knew you would too. <laughs> we always shared that cup of coffee. That was our go-to. Jim said to me, that uh, we had uh, coffee going, and we got up, and Jim wasn't feeling well that morning. I could tell it. And we all knew it. We all knew it. We tried to take care of Jim. We really did, Rita. We tried to take care of him. 
Another camp out that comes to my mind was when we were all camped up at Hugh Dresbach's camp, uh, up at his cabin. And uh, Jim was up there on top of the hill, and I was down at the bottom of the hill with Troop 170, and I looked up on the hill, and there's Jim's big red truck. If you know Jim, that's, that was Jim. That was Jim. Jim came in late that night with his troop. Don't know if you, any of you boys remember that or not, but it was a late evening you came in. We were going to do the winter hike. And we've done the winter hike every year since then. You know, uh, they asked me to talk about uh, the Boy Scouts. And I think the last thing that we had was when Carol Beanie asked me, I was the state president of the Sons of the American Revolution. And I got invited by Carol Beanie to the last corner of honor that Jim Ramey was holding. He had 10 new Eagle Scouts. Are any of those Eagle Scouts in here tonight? Okay. That's all right. Because I know Jim made a big difference in their lives. Jim told me I should leave BSA and join Carol and him in Trail Life USA. That was in 2013. He wanted me to go down to Cincinnati with you guys. I told him I couldn't. Because I had boys that counted on me in Troop 170. If you know me, every boy that I have in a troop is my boy. Because... I have no children, but I love to see men grow just like Jim did. Jim and I started Troop OH116. I went to my church and I asked for permission to have them sponsors. And the first person I called was Jim Ramey. Jim once told me, he says, if you start a troop down here in my area, in our area, I'll be there. And he was. He trained these boys. He worked with these boys. He's been a good leader. He was our committee chairman. And if you've been on the committee as a chairman, you understand the responsibilities there. And he worked hard at it. From that point on, Jim and I did a lot of camping together. We did a lot of planning together. We worked together to pull off things that we couldn't do. But there's something I want to bring out that Jim did for me. And uh, I think you all need to hear this. When we started that voice, that, that troop, that Trail Life troop, we had two boys. Two boys. And Jim would look at me and say, it's okay, Tony, we've got two boys. He'd be so upbeat. And when it all came out, I got to the point where I was becoming discouraged. I'll be honest. I'd started the troop, but I became discouraged to the point where I said, Jim, what are we doing this for? We're banging our heads against the wall. We've only got two boys, and we're not going to get anywhere this way. And Jim, in his teaching way, said, hang in there, Tony. Don't give up. Don't give up. If we can have only one boy, one boy, we'll hold a meeting. He told me, boys were important. One boy is important. You can have a dozen boys, 
You can have a dozen boys. But if you can reach one boy with the out of doors and with Jesus Christ and help them to know that they are loved. There's a lot of men out here who have not taken the time to love their children. But there's a lot of them that do. And I'm thankful for that. But I want to say, Jim taught me this one thing. Never quit, even if you've got only one wife. I got a note from another scouter here, and I want to read just a portion of her letter to me. Jim wanted to help boys become men. He was patient, teaching, training, guiding, supporting, encouraging. This was a part of him. It was who he was. Whether it was instructing and repelling, tying knots, fire building, advising which socks to wear, <laughs> hiking or cooking, or the last thing we had was a Thanksgiving turkey. And Jim taught the boys how to fix that turkey. He guided us all through the process, boys and adults. He enjoyed his Monday evening meetings with his troop, and of course, all the campouts. He would say, and he's talking about OH116 here, the boys had a great time and learned a lot. I knew he was also saying he had a great time. The outdoors rejuvenated him. He was proud of the boys, and he loved to hear from former Boy Scouts and child lifers about how their life was going and what they were up to in their adult lives. He knew no stranger, and he made everyone feel welcome. The last words that Jesus spoke, uh, that, that Jim spoke to me, I called him in the morning before he went into the hospital, and he says, him and Rita were on the way to the hospital. I said, I'll be praying for you. He says, don't worry. He says, We'll see you again, Tony. If not here, then there. We'll have a little talk with Jesus and we'll have a cup of coffee. Jim was my friend. And I'm very happy to have known him because he taught me so much. And I thought I had some answers for boys, but Jim taught me a lot. Thank you. Hello, folks. I'm a better man today because of Jim Ramey. Anybody else? Yeah. All right, so uh, I'm going I'm to give a couple quotes here. This first one is from Tim Tebow. I'm sure you've heard of Tim Tebow. man stands up against uh, what society's thrown at him, and I... I, I uh, I, I really appreciate uh, anything Tim Tebow does. This is something sent, Tim Tebow sent out the other day. One of the greatest things we can do in life is influence other people for the better. I believe every time we meet someone, it never ends in neutral. The experience of us is either positive or negative. Think about the people you encounter in your own life. Ever notice how some are life givers and some are life takers? With some exceptions, i found most people fall into one or two of these categories. The big idea is that every opportunity you have with someone is an opportunity to influence that person for the good. Jim was a life giver. He was always had a positive attitude and a positive experience to share. And it was always for the good. Always for the good. 
So, we talked about this lady called Carol Beanie. Some of the scouters are here know Carol Beanie, right? Okay. I got to know Carol Beanie. What an amazing woman Carol Beanie was. Well, I'll tell you, it got to the point, though, when she would call me, I'm looking at my phone like, am I ready to commit an hour? And, and, it, and I, had to, I, had to, I had to look at my schedule to whether I would answer. Yeah, I see some heads not in here. Jim, Jim was the same way. He goes, Kent, I really appreciate you stepping in because you've taken some of the weight off of me. So, anyway, we, we, when we first started Trail Life, we were, we were at a, a meeting in uh, Belleville. It's a little bit north of here. And some of you folks were there. And, uh, yeah, some of you folks were there. And it was just a, it was, we were just creating this thing called Trail Life USA. We had just come from a national convention in, in Nashville, and I didn't meet any of these folks at there because it was just we were bump, bumper to bumper, shoulder to shoulder, running into folks. But, you know, uh, I, got to, I got to talk to Carol Beanie for a little bit a couple days before. I said, Carol, you want to say something to this event? You, you sound like you, you, you're excited to talk. And, yeah, she was always excited to talk, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, she got, Ken, I would love to talk there. So, so after it was all done, she comes up to me and says, I've been talking to you, Kent, and you sound a lot like my friend Jim Ramey. I didn't know there was another one out there like that. I says, well, who's this Jim Ramey? I says, well, I'm going to introduce to him. And you know what? You two are going to be best friends. And uh, she was right. I can count four best friends. My wife's one of them. Jim's on there. I have four that I can count as best friends. And you know how many best friends I have today? I still have four. He's always, always going to be my best friend. That doesn't come lightly with me. Because uh, I, I, I set a high bar to, to friendship. But Jim, Jim was one of those guys. But Carol, Carol uh, she set the table. Anyway, we go to this first camp out. We set to the first camp out in uh, Hocking Hills. I can't remember when it was. Somebody's got a patch that says it. But anyway, um, we had, I had talked to Jim on the phone, and he said, I love his voice. Well, you guys got great voices in your family. Yeah, you know, he, he has a deep voice. You know, Jim Ramey. You know? So that would sound like Jim, didn't it? Well, anyway, um, I walk into this campsite. It's where the staff was supposed to be camping. And I walk in, and I think it was like in the morning or so. I can't remember what it was, but there's this guy over there. He's got this awesome-looking kitchen set up. And he's got these big fry pan skillets, and he's baking biscuits in a skillet, and he's whipping up, throwing some flour, and he's, he's, not, he's not measuring cup and anything like that. So he's just, yeah, it's good enough, and a little bit of this. And He was making sausage gravy. Now, if you see my physique, I'm a sausage gravy and biscuits fan here, okay? So... So I tell you what, that, that was a good start meeting Jim Ramey. And uh, Jim, uh, we, we hit it off immediately. Yeah, so, so I, want, I wanted to tell you about the biscuits and gravy because that's been our, our thing from, from the, from the get-go. We have always share stories, and we always go back to the biscuits and gravy. But the um, definition of a friendship is a, a true friend has your back no matter what. Isn't that right? Okay. They watch out for you and assure you are not in danger and a true friend will always have your best interest at heart. That's, that's the truth. I can hear Jim right now. You all quit fussing about me. Can you hear him? He, he'd be saying that right now. He says, why are you all doing this? But, but the true friend that Jim is, he, he would say that. He would say to Kent, it's not a good idea. You don't need to be doing this. But yes, it is. This is so important to celebrate Jim Ramey's life. Uh, Jim Ramey has passed on. Jim, Jim is now, now with, uh, with the Lord. And he's with Carol... And she's probably talking her, his ear off. I remember one time it was Marty Huffman. I don't know if Marty's here or not. Is Marty here? Maybe not. But anyway, Marty Huffman and I were we were driving to Knoxville, Tennessee for a trail life event. And you know, in trail life, it's a lot different than Boy Scouts. I used to get upset as a district chair that I have to drive two counties to go to a council meeting. Now we we hop on airplanes and fly or, or drive 10, 12 hours at a time to go to some meeting. It's a lot different. But, but we were driving to Knoxville, and I called Jim. Jim had Carol Beanie riding with him. And, and uh, um, I, said, yeah. I said, Jim, how's it going? He says, she's sucking the air out of the cab. 
And, 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 and it was just, so, it was just so, so funny to hear that because Carol was talking to Zero. But, you know, it, th that was a friendship there too. But he would say, quit fussing about me today. You know, we had this, we had this team of folks that uh, right from the beginning, we decided that we were going to do anything, anywhere, and go do anything, anywhere to help Trail Life and help the, help the ministry, help ministry to these young men. And you guys know who you are. There's a go team. It's called the Ohio go team. We didn't create it. It just happened. Jim was one of the original go team members. Anybody needed something, we would get in our vehicles. And I, I don't know, where's Jim's wife? You know, every time we'd call, Jim says, I'm there. I'm sure you were like, okay, Jim, are you going to leave again? My wife looked at me and she says, well, you, you guys going to, you going to West Virginia now? Or, but, but, you know, the support of the spouses is amazing. And we so thank our spouses for, for supporting us, for being the go team and going anywhere to help Trail Life. Because when we started Trail Life, we made stuff up. There wasn't, there wasn't any documents that you had. And Jim, Jim was part of creating a lot of those documents. Because he brought his skill set and he brought his knowledge and his, and his giving. He brought all that to this new organization called Trail Life USA. And, and, and his, his, his ideas and his suggestions are stamped all over the place. Heck, his pictures in the, the latest handbook like three or four times. So that's that's impressive. Um, but the go team, we would go to Knoxville, Tennessee, Nashville, Kentucky, Georgia, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Indiana. We went to New Mexico. We drove in a box truck to New Mexico, 21 hours. That was dumb. That was really dumb. But we did it. It was, you ever drive in a box van, the, the seats are straight back. There's no, there's no comfortable way to sleep. Fatigue actually takes over. And Jim, Jim, I look over, you see the picture of Jim sleeping? That was one of our things. I took that picture, but he's taking pictures of me sleeping, and I really look stupid. But we would, we would, we would use that against each other. I'd say, you better change it, or I'm going to send this picture out. Well, Jim, I got a picture of you, too. It's just a fun little thing. We just loved it. But, uh, you know, we go everywhere. And, and Jim is... Jim was there almost all the time. There's times he couldn't because he you know, had the responsibility of his family, the responsibility of his job, and, and we, we all understand that. But you know, one of those other phrases that Jim and I would we'd, we'd, we'd uh, share all the time, and it's usually when something went, went awry or went, had to be changed a little bit or had a little difficulty or we'd just make fun of each other, we'd say, there I was. And then we tell the story. Some of you guys have heard that there I was, am I right? Yeah, some of you, okay. Phone calls. <clears throat> All the time we'd, we'd call each other. I knew not to call Jim between 8.30 and 11.30 because he's working at the golf course. But I also knew that around 12.30 to 1.30 that he would call because he was done with lunch. He didn't care when I was eating lunch. But I always tried to call when he was at lunch, but he'd call me whenever. But it was, but it was good. But... But anyway, we would throw ideas out to each other. Remember, we started in trail life. We didn't have anything to work with. We had to create things. And, and Jim, we created a lot of things over the phone. Um, dumb ideas, good ideas. Um, our most recent idea, I was talking to Jim the day before he passed. It was a Sunday. I was talking about uh, creating a men's retreat. He was always thinking of others. Is that right? He's always, always thinking of other people. And when we did this Daniel Boone event, we had like 800, almost 800 participants at this event back in October. And I knew some of you guys were there, right? Jim recognized, he said, yeah, I went over to the rifle range, and I recognized that those adventurers are having a great time shooting 22s, but he also recognized the adults that were wiping drool because they wanted to do that too. Remember, we're all just big 12-year-olds. That's, that's, that was the biggest thing. We're all big 12-year-olds here. We all want to do what the trailmen are doing. So we thought, let's have a, let's have a men's retreat. And I appreciate you you're getting the rifles for us because now we know we can have this retreat. I don't know where it's going to happen yet. We were going to have it at the place but, you know, where we were thinking about, but uh, um, Jim will help us along with that, I'm sure. But that's, that's how it was. He would come up with ideas how to improve um, trail life for our young men. He's always thinking about the, the youth and more ministry. Any way we can get more ministry for our trailmen. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Well, we, all, we talked about the Jim's Coffee. It was great. It was, Jim's Coffee is a famous now, famous thing we have in trail life. I think we did it in Scouts. I was in Scouts for 43 years, so I, I know all the scouting thing. But 
uh, there's a different name for when you had to go build a fire and then put a cup of water in there and then put a coffee in there and make your scoutmaster or your troopmaster drink all the coffee. He had a name for it, and said, yeah, that didn't sound right. Said, Let's call it Jim's Coffee. And that's one of the few times Jim never pitched a fit. He liked the idea. He liked the idea that we called it Jim's Coffee. So it'll ever, forever be called Jim's Coffee. Proverbs 27.11, uh, well, actually 27.17, am I right? As, uh, as iron sharpens iron, so does men sharpen each other. Jim, as his brother said, give her this first, uh, first experiment or first project, Jim poured it out. He poured everything. He was, a, he was an encyclopedia walking around, and he wanted to share everything that he knew with these trailmen and with these leaders. He gave it from the heart. He gave it from the mind. He gave it from the soul. He gave everything. And I, I, I learned so much from Jim as well. I, I'm one of these guys. I know everything. Until I ran into Jim. He's like, I don't know everything. And I believe the same thing with him. He's like, I knew everything. So we ran into some of the other folks. We all learned from each other. But he poured it out. He shared all he knew. Um, men in this room today, men, and when tra and trail life, we call anyone from five years old to 95 years old, we call them men. Because we're all men. How many men in this room today learn something, anything from Jim Ramey? How many? Oh my goodness. Look at this, Dan. Look at this. That's amazing. That is, that is wonderful. Jim, Jim impacted so many lives. And I believe, I believe his goal was for you young men and you older fellows, you older 12-year-olds here, but all of you, I believe you, every one of you, Jim is trying to get you to learn as much as you can so you can turn around and train and teach the next generation. Jim is a perfect example of the next generation sharing it. I wish we had that picture. There it is. There's a photograph. I took that photograph, and I, I think it speaks volumes. Because this was back in October. This is, this is what, three, four months ago. Jim is in charge of the Daniel Boone event. And you can see Jim leaning, leaning on the truck. He's satisfied that he knows that he has taught the next generation. I could see it. He's looking away. He's not looking at Eric. He's looking away. He knows that it's in good hands. He's got a relaxed stand to him. He's leaning. Jim doesn't usually do that. He's got a relaxed stance. And Eric, this is the next generation, and he's standing next to Connor French, who's a, who's a trailman. This is what we need to continue to do in trail life, and this is what Jim wanted everyone to know, that at some point, you, 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 and you, and everyone else, we're all going, going to pass onto, onto, the, onto heaven. We are all going to pass. But as we go, we want to share and teach and get, prepare the next generation. This is the same thing for parents out there. He's the same way with parents. You want dads, dads, hang, around, hang out with your kids. Do whatever you can. Don't put them aside. They grow up too quick. He knows. He had, he had, had kids. <sighs> Jim was very happy that, uh, I do this thing called Tips from the Trail. He was very happy that any time I'd say, hey, Jim, can I take a video of you teaching? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. He usually would push away from things, but that he wanted to make sure that we encapsulated what he knew so generations later could actually look back. Who's this Jim Ramey guy? Look at it. He's teaching, he's teaching how to tie the clove hitch. That's an interesting, I, I like that because listen to his voice. He's poured it out. You can tell it's different. It's different the way he poured it out. <clears throat> At the 2013 National Convention, uh, we were blessed to have a keynote speaker. Governor Mike Huckabee uh, spoke at our convention. How many of you guys were there? Anybody? You guys all remember, remember Huckabee talking? Well, I just read one of uh, his most recent books, and I think it was Medium Rare and Fairly Well or something. I can't remember the exact name, it, but I did pull a quote out. And this is something that uh, Huckabee, uh, Governor Huckabee stated. The value of one's life is seen in the character of those whose lives were touched, whether children, extended family members, or even strangers who benefited in some way from a person's influence. Jim was that guy, wasn't he? Absolutely. I'm on the last page, by the way. Okay, cool. 
uh, he understood the importance of that next generation, just like we're talking about that this photo up here. Uh, he's been preparing all of you, all of you to step up and do more. And he, he, talked to, he talked to me a while back. We were sitting, I don't remember what it was, but we were talking about the tank. You ever had anything left in your tank? If you, don't get, if you have something left in your tank, you're not giving it all. How many, of you guys, how many young men out here are distance runners? I know I talked to one of them. We talked today about, do you have anything left in your tank? You said yes. Never leave anything left in the tank. Pour it all out. Have a, have, just pour it all out because if you run out, someone's going to pick you up anyway. Okay? And that's, that's what, that's what Ramey said. He never wanted to leave anything in the tank. I was, uh, I was always put, uh, uh, moved by this little thing called living the dash. Jim lived the dash. You guys know what I'm talking about with living the dash? We have a birth date. We have a death date, and we have a dash in between. Are you, you living that dash? I believe, I believe he lived that dash. I believe he lived every second of that dash, but when we listen to Dan and, and his, scouting, uh, his scouting times and his times of trail life, he's living, he was living that dash. So I believe he wants to make sure that we all completely live that dash. Don't put it off for another day. We've all done that, haven't we? Uh, the, we have a trail life motto. It was born from Colossians 1.10. And we spoke about this earlier. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's a, that's a powerful verse, and that's a powerful, that's a powerful uh, motto, to walk worthy. I believe, I believe an example that we can all teach our trailmen uh, from this day forward, if we haven't already, is we knew a man. His name was Jim Ramey. And he lived and was the epitome of walking worthy. I don't think too many of you folks out there would disagree with me on that. So, um, closing here, in recognition of Jim, um, we have this event called the Daniel Boone Base Camp. We, we, we created this seven years ago. I, I believe it's seven. Was it last year, seventh year? So we created this seven years called the Daniel Boone Base Camp 101. Now think about it. When we were on the phone, Throwing this back and forth, and there's a couple other people involved with this as well. When we were talking about the Daniel Boone base camp, think about it. Daniel Boone was a pioneer. He he had all that outdoor skills, and we wanted to marry that in because you know that we're, Daniel Boone hung out here in Ohio. Actually, he was prisoner in Ohio, and he went back to Kentucky and he fought the Indians and all that. But we thought Daniel Boone was a good good name for our trailman to say. Who's Daniel Boone? We still get that. Who's Daniel Boone? Base camp. You guys all know about base camp at, uh, at the Mount Everest? Base camp Mount Everest, you got to go there and hang out for three or four weeks or whatever just to get acclimated. This is the acclimation camp. This is where we want you to come and learn the base camp skills. 101 is basic. We want you to be basic, to learn the basic stuff, the camping, the cooking, the fires, the, the knife, the, the, all the other stuff that comes with it. But Jim took this project called the Daniel Boone Base Camp and he made it he made it the way it is today. We had how many almost 800 participants at the last one during this COVID thing. This is the most amazing thing we've ever experienced. Uh, a few of us leaders got together and felt it was important that from this day on it's going to be called the Jim Ramey's Daniel Boone Base Camp 101. Now when you go out there today in this uh, in this reception area you'll see this big huge log that was cut out and we got this we got this, this, this his name on there with the Daniel Boone. We would like you to sign that. And we're going to take that every year to Jim Ramey's Daniel Boone Base Camp and set it out for any future, any new trailman that shows up, that they get to sign it too. And they get to say, who is Jim Ramey? And Jim Ramey's name is right next to Daniel Boone. That's pretty cool. I don't care who you are. So anyway, um, there's also, if you'd like to make a donation to a, a, trail, uh, a scholarship fund for training youth in trail life. Uh, we've already collected over $4,000, and it's really amazing that we're going to you put that to good use. So if you feel compelled to, to be part of that, there's a, there's a basket out there. I want to thank the church here. I want to thank everyone. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here. And I know a lot of folks could not be here, and they, were, they want to watch in. I believe we've got this on video. So thank everyone for everything you do. Pour it out. Pour it out. Give it all. Don't leave anything in the tank, because that's what Jim wants you to do. Thank you, folks.
I'm Sean B2, and Rita, I'm one of your Trail Life sons. And I want to thank you for giving me such a great Trail Life dad. I represent all the other sons that you have that are here and that are not present because Jim invested into us, and I'm just a 12-year-old boy at heart that loves to find the goodness of God and his creation, and Jim was the one that pointed me to that. I jumped into trail life in about 2017, and soon afterward went to the Trail Ready Learners Conference and met several men, and I said, that's a man I want to follow. And I remember going off to the side part of that church, and then the walls were all bricks and blocks. It was late in the afternoon. I was kind of tired. And Jim was the one that was teaching that session on high adventure. And I said, this is the guy I got to listen to. Well, we had an opportunity not long after that to have training for Peak 3, what we call Peak 3, where we as the leaders learn how to lead our sons on campouts and to go into adventure campouts. And part of that roundup was Jim Ramey. I said, I got to go. And I was, Kent didn't know me at the time yet. And there were so few guys signed up for it that I just kind of texted Kent and said, Kent, um, is it all right if I try to write something up try to stir up some interest in this. And so I got together with my buddy Rich, and we started talking about the legendary Jim Ramey. Bacon Grease Jim. Raised by possums and raccoons in the wild. And all the other things that he had invested. And I started writing this up, and it was wonderful. I think we had about 25 dads show up for that after that, to be part of that. And I remember going to that training and Jim coming and saying to me, I'm a legend. Sean said it. <laughs> and while we were there at that training that, that weekend, we were doing fire, primitive fire. We just learned how to do fire by friction and a little uh, cotton ball with ash. And Jim looked for a volunteer and I quickly raised my hand. He said, come on up. And he and I got down together by that little fire pit on our hands and knees, and Jim taught me what to do right with me. And I was, jumped right in there, and pretty soon that, that cotton started smoking. And I looked up, and Rita, I saw the gleam of a father's eye in his eye, I said, there's nothing better than this. We have been touched. We have been blessed to know a legend like Daniel Boone. We don't need Daniel Boone. We need Jim Ramey. And Jim Ramey was passing those skills off to us because as we have been involved in trail life, we understand that trail life is life on the trail. And ultimately, that life leads to eternal life with our King in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything about Jim screened that. It wasn't long afterward, they roped me in and doing some other stuff for them. That's how it works in trail life, by the way. If you have sucker written on your head, they'll find you. But the thing was, it's fun. And all of a sudden I said, forget about COVID. We have time to teach. Got on the phone. We got to get Jim on video. Rita, we've captured Jim on video teaching so many things in this last year that I never thought we would. I got another one coming out sometime soon on Jim tying knots. It's, it's fresh material. It's not been published yet. The beautiful thing is that Jim did these things because he loved to point us on the right path so that we could see Jesus. In his very last video, he started out this way by quoting from Ephesians 6. Men, put on the armor of God, and you need to stand firm. And so tonight I'm going to teach you how to put on cold weather gear so you can stand firm. I'm like, you go, Jim. 
Because everything, just like our carrot cake, Jim brought Jesus into it. And it would be amiss of us today to not speak that our wonderful father, brother, is in the eternal care of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Because trail life is actually more than just learning how to live the rugged outdoor adventure. Trail life is pointing us toward a king, toward a savior. And Jim would have helped us to see there's two ways for us to live in this life. And I want to quickly talk with you this, this morning, uh, this afternoon, the w- choices that we face as we come to understand what life is all about. You see, this world starts on understanding this way, that there is a king that has created us. He's made us. And as you'll see on this coming slide, that God is the loving ruler and creator of this world. He's made it good. He's made it for us to enjoy. That's what trail life is all about. Getting us outdoors so that we can see the joy of what is outdoors and to see the creator through his creation. And what God did is he made us rulers to care for this world, protect it, to use it, to fill it. One of the beautiful things about God in this that we so often misunderstand about God today is everything in that garden at the beginning was a yes. I love that about Jim. Jim said, you want to do it? Go for it. It wasn't Jim trying to tell you, no, I'm not going to let you do that. I mean, I wanted to bring black powder log splitting to the Daniel Boone, and he's like, You got one? Let's do it. (laughs) Everything with God in the garden, except for one, was a yes. There was only one no. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What we chose to do is we chose to rebel against God and to want to do the one no when there are all the yeses there for us. We're really rebels at heart. Rebels who have turned from a good and gracious king, thinking that we can be our own king. That's the, what the world tells us today. Find yourself. Become your own boss. Follow your way. And what Jim would teach us in his actions was this. There's a king and we need to follow him together. Well, the reality of the next thing is, is that God through his son Jesus Christ, gives us what we deserve as rebels. Rebels, rebellion brings death. And as we see this on the next slide, God gives rebels what they deserve. God is a holy God who keeps his word, who is faithful and just. And he gives us what we ask for in in rebellion against him. You will surely die. Yet we see that God loving and gracious and merciful so that he would send ultimately his son Jesus Christ as we see next the man who would die for rebels the man who would come in the image that we could understand of our own flesh as God very God go and live a perfect life die in our place rise again, that we might have life in his name and follow him. Jesus is the king. Jim's life pointed us to Jesus' kingship. And ultimately what this comes down to last of all is this. There's a choice for us. There's two ways to live. We can either go our way, thinking that we're king, Or we can follow Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He calls us to follow him and to be his children. Jim exemplified that for us in his life. Jim was a man who lived his faith boldly. If you saw his post on social media, he was not afraid to speak of his faith in Christ. And Trailman, can I say this about Jim? 
more importantly than learning how to make a primitive fire, more importantly than knowing how to repel, more importantly than knowing how to fire a 22, is do you know who is your king and are you following him? Because of the freedom that he found in following our Lord and Savior, we now know that our brother is enjoying the greatest freedom he has ever known in the presence of our Lord and Savior. The place that we someday can be with him as well. And he would challenge us, I think, in these three ways by how we watched his life. Number one, he would say to us, following Jesus Christ is so important. And as you follow him, that gives you, as men, the ability to act like men. 1 Corinthians says this, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. That was what Jim encouraged us to do. As we think of this this, this evening, I challenge us to re realize the opportunity that we have to stand firm together. If you look closely at the bookends of 1 Corinthians, it begins by saying, I really couldn't treat you as adults, but I, as immature as babies. But by the time the book ends in the last chapter, chapter 16, we go from immaturity to maturity. Act like men. Secondly, as we follow the king, we follow Jim. We can be imitators as Jim imitated Christ to us. Kent spoke of iron sharpening iron. We are to walk worthy together. We are to sharpen those around us. As we follow Jesus, we leave a trail for others to follow. Act like men. Follow me as I follow Christ. And lastly, fight the good fight of faith. Do not hold back. Give it all. Take hold of the eternal life to which we're called. 1 Timothy chapter 4, as the Apostle Paul is ready to go to be with his Savior, our Savior, as Jim has, he said these words, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Can I say to all of us, on behalf of Jim, the whole purpose of trail life is to see that we have eternal life in Jesus. To find that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Why do we act like men? Why do we pursue following other men that we find great examples in? Why do we fight well? Because there is a trail that we know that we need to follow. And our dear brother has plowed it before us. I'm 50 years old this year, guys, but I'm only 12 years old at heart. Believe me, I like to blow things up too. I like to see things go, woof. <laughs> My name should be Pyro. Trailman, you have a legacy to follow. A legacy in Jim as he poured out his life to follow Jesus. And he's passing the baton to us today. Will you take it? Will you take and say, here's the opportunity. I have left this life. I'm waiting for you on the other side. Lead others like I have led you. Amen? May that be our heart's cry. Trailman honors God. Father, we thank you for the joy that we know that as your children to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. 
Thank you for the faith that you have given Jim. Thank you for the way that he followed you so faithfully. Thank you for forgiving him of all of his sins and making him your child. May he find great joy in your presence and may you be our sole comfort as we long also to be with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name.